Welcome to Wisdom for Life, where we sift through philosophy to find practical advice that you can use in your everyday life. Hi, I'm Dan Hayes. I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Greg Sadler. Today we're talking about... Examining the ethical dimensions of a-holery. And everybody knows what we mean by a-hole. We're going to try to keep it... I'm not sure if it's PG or G by not (laughs) saying the word over and over and over again. But what we're looking at are the AITA forum, or Reddit rather. Subreddit. Subreddit, there you go. And we've got some cases picked out that we're going to plow through and make our own judgments on. And you can go you know, to the subreddit and check these out. These are all from the last week or so. Uh, so easy enough, I think, to find. And we've talked about this before in the past. We devoted three other episodes, number 30, 41, and 53 to AITA, that is, Am I the A-Hole, um, Reddit posts. And they're, they're really fun to explore. So we thought we'd do another one. Uh, it's been a while, right? So, mm-hmm. so we should talk about you know, just as a refresher for our listeners, what are AITA posts? Now, you spend more time on Reddit, I think, than I do, Dan, don't you? Unfortunately, <laughs> or fortunately, depending on the circumstances. Yeah. yeah. So um, it is a subreddit in which people, you know, make their case. They say, like, this situation happened, um, and they give information. They ask the community, am I the a-hole? Um, the question is, like, how much of this information are we getting? Are they providing you the full view of the events we don't know so what we're trying to do is only from the information it's given um you know what is the initial impression as well as maybe like okay what would be some things that potentially would change this um but regardless of that we will at least from the initial impression give a an answer of you know not the a-hole um uh, yes, the a hole. No one's the a hole, or everyone's the a hole. <laughs> I like that last one. Um, you know, there, there, everyone sucks. Yeah, there are some some situations where you're like, wow, what you what you did, what you chose, was really a bad idea. But <laughs> it does make sense that you chose it because that other person over there is a jerk, and the other people who were weighing in on it are also jerks, and it just kind of expands. And we should point out too. I mean, this is social media. So people do weigh in on these, and then sometimes the original poster will clarify something or get into a, an argument, a sub-argument with the other people <laughs> who are saying something about it, right? And um, I, I use Twitter more than Reddit myself, and I see quite a few of these make their way into Twitter and come in for discussion there as well. I wonder if there's other social media where this is happening. Do you do you happen to it's know? Gotta, I, I don't know, but like maybe Instagram or you know who knows, uh, World Star. <laughs> um, but uh, I guess the, the thing that we also do that's kind of unique in these episodes is we're going to try to give some sort of uh, moral foundation to why mm. we are going to make these things. You know, we can say, go from um, some sort of deontological or um, virtue-based or contractualism or um, utilitarianism. You know, you can find a whole bunch of like bases and we'll kind of like you know give why these things fit into these categories yeah we're not just shooting from the hip you could say right we i mean we may be wrong but we at least have (laughs) some justification for for what we're saying and you know the aita subreddit it, it does pose itself as being sort of like an applied space for moral philosophy. They've got this description, a catharsis for the frustrated moral philosopher in all of us, and a place to finally find out if you were 
wrong in an argument that's been bothering you. Tell us about any nonviolent conflict you've experienced. Give us both sides of the story and find out if you're right or if you're the a-hole. And I, I kind of like that, the frustrated moral philosopher in all of us sort of implying that whether you've taken an ethics class or had some sort of ethics training or you know whatever, all of us are a moral philosopher. The question is whether we're good ones or not, right? Right. We all have like this like feeling uh, like we have uh you know different things that like just give us a gut feeling of that is wrong um and uh you know people are going to respond to those and, and certain people will respond more negatively to certain things than others um yeah it's quite true but uh uh what we're trying to do here is to try to at least systematize those uh feelings into something that is uh <laughs> can actually be categorized. We're trying to bring more light than heat, you could say, right? There we go. Yes. You know, the, It'll be the LEDs and not the incandescent bulbs. There you go. Yeah. And, you know, when we think about why we classify people as jerks, a-holes, pick whatever you want. Creeps could be another thing in some of these cases. So as Dan was mentioning, there's a lot of moral theory or ethical perspectives we can look at things from, and we'll explain them along the way. Um, but generally, there's going to have been some sort of something went wrong, right? There's a there's a conflict, there's a dilemma, there's some sort of violation of a norm, or something was given priority when it shouldn't have been, um, or sometimes people seem to lack common sense or, or decency. And then you know, there's also the question of, as you mentioned, how the story is framed. Sometimes people will read it and they'll be like, "You just sound like a jerk the way you're talking about this. <laughs> Why did you choose these words? Why did you say?" it this way and and i think there's also in some of the cases we're going to look at there's people who they get into a conflict they could resolve it but they don't and then it turns into a grudge or it turns into a guilt trip or it turns into people not speaking to each other or giving each other the cold shoulder and so the the conflicts get perpetuated and you know actually we should we should think about this why do you think like it I wouldn't go on to Reddit myself and put a case there and say, well, what do you think, world? I mean, would you do that, Dan, with any of the things you've gone through? No, I usually will ask people that I have close relationships that I want, you know, that I feel like you're going to give me an honest review. But, like, there's – it's interesting that there's a point of, like, anonymity where people are like, I don't care. Yeah, like, yeah. They're, they're not trying to help you, or, like, you know coddle you or anything they're gonna just give you what they want i don't know it's just i think the it only works because of the anonymity okay we're asking a lot of people that you knew i'd only ask a very small subset of the people that i knew to try to give me some really good advice uh but yeah it's it's a i guess i'd do it to okay. ask, answer your question i don't you? Yeah, well yeah. i don't know that i I don't, I don't know that I would go on there i like the idea of asking close friends people whose opinions i value I'm, although I will admit, and I've done it jokingly, I have had a few times where I've gone on Twitter and other social media and said, um, so, you know, somebody wants me to do X, Y, Z. I don't want to do it because of this. What, what do you think about that? You know, for example, and this may come across as very petty to some people. Um, I don't like people calling, things podcasts that don't actually have like an rss feed or an mp3 file i think mm. you know so like some people have a video channel and they'll call it the such and such podcast and then they'll invite me on as a philosopher for you know whatever it's going to be and i'll look I'll, you know i'll put it in google and i'll look to see whether the, there's an actual podcast somewhere like on apple podcast or spotify or you know, soundcloud <laughs> or whatever right and there isn't right. any it's just the youtube channel and then i'll be like you don't really have a proper podcast do you and they'll you, a lot of times people are kind of bemused about this. They're like, well, no, it's it's a podcast. And I'll be like, podcast means there's a sound file somewhere. This is just a video recording. You know, what? Are, why are you billing it as that? And it was interesting. When I put that out there, there were a lot of people. And so I did it in YouTube, my YouTube channel. I did it in uh, Twitter and in Facebook. And there were a lot of people who weighed in and they're like, who the hell are you to call things a podcast or not? And I was like, well, 
there is a definition of it, you know? Um, we can't just make words mean whatever the hell we want, like Humpty Dumpty, you know? We uh, we should probably call things by their proper names. And they were so offended that I was taking, you know, uh, exception to calling things podcasts. They were, it was, it was like way over the top, you know? And then there were other people who were like, you must define podcasts strictly or else you may not do that. And it's so like at the other extreme, you know? <laughs> Um, so I had long story short, I have actually yeah. gone to the internet sometimes to see whether not whether I was being the, the a-hole, although I suppose I could have, you know, been classified as one for turning people down. Uh, but rather whether I was, I guess you could say whether I was the being pedantic or whether I was rightly insisting on words, meaning what they mean, you know, I, I guess, um, have you ever done anything like that or, not turn down something like that over that. I guess the way I, I would look at it is internet, like you, you, yeah. you can choose to to filter out requests however you want to. Like if that is your your criteria, that is totally up to you. Um, you know if well, I do I do I, guess, I do actually have something kind of lurking in the back of my head saying if you can't actually use language more or less correctly and you want to double down. You're probably not going to be a good host, and it's not going to be a good use of my time. Oh, well that that is an interesting and actually useful like uh, assertion. Pre, no, um, uh, 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 indicator. Okay, um, for which I think is I don't have any problem with that. Yeah, but um, what I was asking though is, have you like put something out there on the internet? Like, I've asked not. People for okay, uh, but I, I don't think I have, would have any particular qualms against it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just, um, you just need a good moral dilemma then, right? Right. <laughs> um, but uh, we should jump. Maybe in. next time we'll have one. So we should. Yeah, we should go in. So we've got um one here, um about paying rent, um to your parents. And so uh, this is from um the title is "Am I the a hole for moving out after my parents told me to pay rent?" No starting off okay like okay maybe this is weird yeah um so i'm at i 19 moved out of my parents house about a year ago there was nothing wrong in my life i had a good upbringing i loved being home and i had a lot of friends and parents were loving or so i thought anyways i was going to have a big 18th birthday and as is the legal age where i stay australia and means to go from boy to man child to adult i had a venture rented out, and I had family and friends come over from all over to celebrate with me. We had a blast at night. I had my first drink and almost made it my last. I don't remember anything from that night, but from the photos I've seen, it looks like I had a good night, so I was happy. A day after that night, my parents sat me down to have a talk. They told me that I'm a man now and that I've been working a lot of hours, yet they haven't received anything. They told me that as soon as I started working, they expected me to help pay rent. Obviously, I did not know. And and any of that because I didn't get told. They told me that I should have known better, but now that I'm 18, they expect me to help with rent. Honestly, I didn't mind helping if they'd asked. I was 16 when I got my first job at McDonald's and am now working construction. But they made it seem like I was in the wrong for not giving them money. And I was where they... And I get where they're coming from, but from a young boy's perspective, all I saw was green. All I saw was a triple-digit paycheck that I wanted to spend right away. Anyways, I told them I'd start helping them from now on, but it wasn't good enough for them. They told me that I had to pay them back all the money that I should have been giving them when I first started working, which was almost 10 k I said no flat out, and they got mad. They told me that either I pay rent and pay them back, or they are what they are owed, or I move out and find my own place. So that's what I did. I moved out a few days after to my friend's house for a bit until I found my own apartment. I have been living here for about 8 to 10 months. As soon as I moved out, I got bombarded with calls and texts saying that I dis disrespected them by not paying them what they owe and making it harder for them to live now that they don't have someone washing or doing their laundry, taking out the rubbish, and all those little stuff. They are both in their early 40s and more than capable of doing it. 
Yeah, this is an interesting one. There's a, there's a, a couple different wrinkles to this, right? So right. what's what's your verdict? Like we should actually like weigh in on each of these and then we'll talk, we'll go into more detail about it. All so right. what's what's your verdict? Uh, g- general verdict, not the asshole. Yeah. I, and actually I would say I would go so far as to say the parents are, you know. Yes. Yeah. Very clearly. Uh for a couple mm-hmm. reasons. So one thing that I was thinking about when I was reading this is if you're going to make ultimatums and somebody actually calls your bluff, you can't complain if you set <laughs> out what the ultimatum is. It's sort of like, you know, if I were to say, um, if I were to go to my, my school and I'm like, unless you pay me more, you're going to have to fire me. And they're like, well, okay, we'll fire you. You know, well, I didn't really mean it that way or, you know, that doesn't work. Once you actually like put the words on the table and that's what they did with the, you got to pay us back 10 grand from your 16 to 18 year old, you know, not paying us thing or move out. And then he says, fine, I'll move out. You know, uh, I don't think they get to complain after that. No, not at all. Like, <laughs> okay, it's one thing, like, if you told someone up front and you, like, you know, if you want to mm. go into, like, you know, uh, contract theory or whatnot. Yeah, or, yeah. Or, uh, you know, like, you, you set out the, the things beforehand. You don't get to retroactively say, oh, you know, uh, you you already owe this from a thing that there's no contract for. So that's that's not going to, you know, fly in that regard. Not to mention, like, uh you're you're 16 to 18 um and i guess i assume but i'm not quite sure that you're still in um high school you know, high school yeah why are you making your kid pay ten thousand dollars from two years of working at mcdonald's in high school that seems yeah. like a rather large portion of that person's wage um, There's another weird thing, too, in the fact, the very end of it, where he says they don't mm-hmm. have someone washing or doing their laundry, taking out their rubbish and all those things, uh, and it's making it harder for them to live. So presumably, even when he was 16 and working this job, he was doing these other things, which is contributing to the household. It's really uncompensated labor that they also want from this kid. <laughs> you know? Right. So it, it seems weird, like, in, in the, also this last sentence, he says that they're in their early 40s. Yeah. This kid is 18. Um, they obviously had their kid um, in their early 20s. Uh, I don't know if they have other kids, but at least this one they had in their early 20s. Um, did they, are they, like, in arrested development? Did they think that their <laughs> kid was just, like, indentured labor? Like, you know. Yeah. I, it's, it's maybe there's something weird with uh, being as was it Austria, uh, um, but no, like, Australia, Australia, yeah, um, like I don't know, the kangaroo meat does something to you. <laughs> I think these are just jerk parents, quite frankly, yeah. that are kind of. I mean, the kid sounds more mature than the parents in many mm-hmm. respects, and I think you're you, you mentioned like if you're going to expect something from somebody, you you can't. You can't expect them to be a mind reader, right? Mm -hmm. You have to actually like lay out what your expectations are. And they did that. You know, they they told me I'm a man now and and they haven't received anything. Um, But then, you know, the other line is they told me as soon as I started working, they expected me to help pay rent. And he says, obviously, I didn't know any of that because I didn't get told. Um, well, if you don't tell them, especially, you know, when there's a power imbalance and a maturity difference, it's on the parents to make this stuff clear to the kid. It's not up to him I'm, to, like, you know, research and figure out what his parents want, right? And unless there's, like, some really strong ingrained cultural thing where, like, kids are supposed to pay their parents and, like, everyone just knows that, like, there's... I, I, I don't I've never see heard any of way that myself. R- n- me neither. But like that'd be the only like caveat that'd be like really change this. Yeah, I will mm-hmm. mention I began paying rent when I was seventeen to my to my mom, and mm-hmm. she was very upfront with it. it. It was in part because I once I finished high school and I was seventeen when I finished high school because my birthday's in August. Um, she had been getting social security survivor benefits because my dad had died when I was 11. And so as a widow, she got a certain amount per month 
and um, what she expected me to contribute. And it wasn't much. It was it was at that time. So we're talking about the late eighties. It was around three hundred dollars, you know. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I was eating way more than that in groceries. I can tell you that, <laughs> right? Not to mention all the other things that went into it. Um, and she was, you know, she came up to me and she was like, okay, so you're done with high school and the social security checks are, they're going to still come for your, your sister, but they're not going to come for you. And I need you to start, you know, helping out. And I, I, I was working. I was working at that time at Ponderosa uh, in Waukesha. <laughs> and I, I was like, yeah, okay, that's that's fine, you know. I mean, it was a sizable part of my paycheck, but it was also quite reasonable for her to ask, you know. But everything was Did like. Did you start taking some steak from Ponderosa as well? Well, this, there's a whole other story to tell about that. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that was really quite funny was so you know i was i was working on uh, as a grill cook and dishwasher and all that and we're cooking these steaks and they they you know they wouldn't cook right some of the time and then suddenly they they started this ad campaign and they're like we're now serving grade a steaks and we're like well what the hell were we cooking before <laughs> 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 right because yeah they had changed the quality. Um, mm-hmm. and, and actually, we would sometimes have cookouts after work, and I think we did sometimes take some of the steaks and stuff and <laughs> cook them up. But I, I think that's par for the course if you work in you know, restaurants. restaurant work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, shall we go to the next one here? Sure. So I'll, I'll read this one, uh, given that I can relate to it. Am I uh, the a-hole for telling my students my contract wasn't renewed? I, 23-year-old female, had a long-term sub-position at a school in my city parallel to my master's studies. I'm studying to be a teacher. I had four classes since the beginning of the school year. My contract ends in two and a half weeks, and there will be five more weeks until summer holidays. Prior to the Easter vacation, the administrator told me I was definitely staying and getting a renewed contract until the summer holidays. Last week, it turned out it won't be renewed because of reasons, like there's no actual reason. I'm sad about it, and I told my students I would no longer be there and when my contract will end exactly so they can plan ahead. I'm actually on good terms with all four classes, but two of them seem to like me really, really, really much. When I told them they said it's not fair and that they want to keep me, I said, well, I also want to keep you, but it's not my decision, but I'm happy to have met you. Well, a few kids decided to make it their decision and told their parents. A good handful of students and parents went to admin and told them what they thought about this not renewing my contract. I received a bitter mail from admin that it was unprofessional to tell the students and was told from a teacher that is close to admin that it's an a-hole move of me, was it? So this is somebody who's kind of doubtful about, you know, whether they crossed a line, whether they did the wrong thing or not. Um, yeah. What, uh, what I, was your I, verdict? <laughs> total not the a-hole. Like, this was really quite easy for me, and, like, especially this whoever this other teacher that's close to admin is like just towing the admin line. Yeah. I mean, would you say that the admin is being an a-hole in this case in saying, Uh, giving the bitter note saying it was unprofessional to tell the students? Um, I think that the more a-holy thing was the saying that, uh, she was going to be employed Mm. and then reneging on that particular, uh, agreement okay um only to um uh, not even have any reason to do it yeah so there's two possible reasons why the admin person is is really an a-hole in this case Mm -hmm. i mean i don't think that it's unprofessional to tell the students and i think a lot of cases uh professional gets a gets abused as a concept to try to Mm -hmm. keep people in line you know if you're going to let somebody go i think at that point you don't have any expectation any reasonable expectation that they're not going to tell other people that unless they like signed an nda or something you know exactly that was my only other thing is like unless it's in the contract once again like you know going back to like contract yeah uh, yeah a contractualism or, or like just contract law. Like unless it's it's been predetermined that you will not disclose any terms of your employment with the students, then you know I, I, there's no professional 
place that I see, as well as like as you're saying, like this is. Uh, the, using the type of the thing professionals like it's not professional to talk with your uh, other employees about your wages but it is protected by law and even though yeah. lots of employers will say that it's like illegal to talk to or you can't talk about that otherwise you might get fired no that's uh bs that's total bs there's, and it's all these things to try to, you know, make sure that there's a very little blowback for the decisions that the administration is making themselves. Yeah, I think you could say that the administration kind of wants to have it both ways, right? They're, and this is actually a larger topic. They're expecting something like loyalty from the employee, in this case, the teacher, but they're not showing any loyalty to them. And you do see this in a lot of um, narcissistic or abusive people, right? They, mm-hmm. Loyalty only goes one way. So, are, so what are all corporations narcissists? Well, no, I think it would be more a matter of the particular managers or executives, the people who are expecting this this sort of thing. I mean, let's let's say we take this in a corporate direction. So, would we say that if somebody's on a renewable contract and then they maybe they get like a bad performance review, right? Mm-hmm. And their boss tells them, "Okay, you're 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 going to be fired in three weeks. You're we're letting you go, right?" Mm-hmm. It wouldn't make sense to say, "Well, you can't say anything about this to anybody, right?" Uh, your fellow Correct. employees or people that that could be contacts to find you another job or something. So why would it why would it be the same in terms of a teacher? It doesn't seem to I don't make know. Sense. Also, like most most corporations aren't gonna say that you're you got three weeks. They're just gonna say, and this is your last day. Yeah, pack up your stuff and leave. Uh, but I don't know. It's it's interesting. Like if if you're gonna follow that script, then uh, I guess it would make sense for you not to even tell her until like it's already passed. But that's Oh, now, but the, then you're really leaving her in the lurch, right? Oh yeah, like uh, it's it's much more of an asshole move in my opinion. But it's uh, it would make sense from the like I want the little the smallest amount of blowback possible. Mm. But the, what they're trying to get here, and they're angry that they're getting any blowback in the first place. Yeah, yeah. I guess this is a question. that's like, it's is it easier to ask permission or to ask forgiveness? And you know, if if they had been fired or let go yeah um then they'd be like asking forgiveness and whereas now you've told them beforehand and now they're like oh you know the students as well as their parents who have some sway over the administration now can weigh in on this topic i mean i think that's another interesting feature of this case too is she didn't go to the administrator and say you know my students are upset Mm -hmm. or something she just told her students and the students got upset and then the students talked to their parents who are the stakeholders who you know maybe are Mm -hmm. paying tuition or something like that right and she didn't like tell the parents hey uh, i'm doing a campaign to try to keep my job or something the parents took it on their own initiative to go to the administrator and express their their uh, concerns or grievances or whatever it's going to be right so they're right. a different agent than than she is right and so like i guess if she was like riling up her students or yeah, you know, yeah, talking you to go. the t- parents and and trying to inform them to do this thing then it, it might be slightly different yeah. but you know like she's she's not instigating directly that uh, someone contact the administration yeah i think when you give information to somebody else and there's no deception there's no coercion you know you're you're just giving them the straight information and then they go and act on that information you're especially if it's information that they deserve to have, right? The students mm-hmm. would like to know that the teacher's going to be there. Now, now it's important information. You're not responsible for what that other person does with that information. You didn't like set them up to go and you know, oh, let's burn the building down or something like that. Not to mention, I think it would actually be 
um, and a whole move to not tell your students, you know, as a mm. you know, the teacher student relationship, Interesting. You know, yeah. there, there's a lot of trust that usually goes with that particular relationship. And if you were just like, yep, yeah, bye, S- never see ya or uh, see ya maybe, um, that seems to be a, a breach of that trust or a breach of the expectations of that relationship. In yeah. The first place. You know, I, as an adjunct, somebody who teaches part-time for different institutions, I have had students come to me um, at places besides Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design, where I have sort of like a continuing expectation of, of uh, working there, which is a, you know, nice security to have. I've had students come up to me and they're like, Oh, I liked your class. I'd like to take another class with you. And then I have to say, well, I don't know what I'm going to be teaching if I'm even going to be teaching here again. And then mm-hmm. they're always like both disappointed, but also super surprised because I think most of them don't, they don't understand um, how it works in contemporary academia that um, most of the people doing the teaching are not, you know, tenure track having reliable expectation of getting rehired all the time you know all right that's kind of dismaying yeah. but i think we need to talk about support dogs sure why don't you read this one all right <clears throat> so uh am i the hill for uninviting a bridesmaid to my wedding because of her support dog spicy <laughs> um, <clears throat> for context me and Amy have been friends since elementary school. We're no longer that close, but we still keep in touch. And she actually introduced me to my fiancé in college. So I asked her to be a bridesmaid. The first time we met, Amy brings Spud, a really cute pug. Unfortunately, I'm really allergic to dogs. I mentioned this to her. She says that he has to accompany her because he's her emotional support dog. I'm not very knowledgeable on support animals, but I respect their roles, so I try to accept it. But by the end of the day, I'm a mess. Just disgusting, and I feel awful. I pull Amy aside and ask if there are any ways she can leave Spud at home for the next meeting. She becomes upset, stating that for health reasons, he has to accompany her, and I I back down. But after two more meetings... All the, uh, two more meetings, though I can't do it because I just feel too sick. I pull her aside and I tell her that I can, just can't uh, be in the same room as Spud. She mentions she already brought him a little suit for the wedding. I inform her that there's just no way he can come. My ceremony is in a tiny church, and he and I will inevitably be in close proximity. This kicks off a big discussion about the importance of support animals and mental health. I completely agree that mental health is significant and understand that Spud is helping, helpful to her. But in the context of my wedding, I just can't be around a dog. She asks if she had a medical condition like seizures or diabetes and needed Spud to help her survive if I would kick him out. I admit it that... I would have to think about it. She stated that this is an example of ableism and that his role is just as important. I then ask if he can come to the wedding that I ask that if he can come to the wedding but can stay outside with his partner or something for the ceremony and then just join her for the reception which is outside. She asks alternatively if I can just take an antihistamine for the ceremony. I let her know that they don't work for me completely, and I get really groggy, so I'd rather not. For another event, I consider it, but for my own wedding, I just don't want to make that kind of compromise. I had a few more exchanges with her, and neither of us is budging. I then tell her that if she insists on bringing Spud to the ceremony, I'm going to ask her not to attend. She is upset, and tells the rest of the wedding party, whose opinions are split. Another bridesmaid is now refusing to go unless I reinvite Spud. I have still refused. So now both Amy and this bridesmaid have Venmoed me for the cost of the dresses and Spud's suit. I paid them, but they are still taking a talking to more guests at the wedding about it. I just feel exhausted. I'm torn between annoyed at the impact this is having on my own wedding, but also the concern that I have made a cruel decision. I'm wondering if the right thing to do was to suck it up and let him come. Am I the a-hole? 
What do you think, Greg? I think that she is definitely not the a-hole, that she's been super accommodating. And I think that her friend is, and I think the other bridemaid is too, you know, and that they're, one of the things that's really telling is that they're, you know, it's resolved. They've both mm-hmm. got their money back and they still want to keep on talking to other people about the wedding. They're so they're trying yeah, they're to agitating. Yeah. They're trying to poison the well, you know? Um, right. And I was really, so, you know, rereading this. So her friend accuses her of ableism, right? Which is an easy thing to throw around, right? Mm-hmm. But her friend is being ableistic too, right? Or ableist because mm-hmm. she's expecting somebody who has allergies to put up with the the provoker, the cause of the allergies, right? Right. Uh, not to mention, the thing is like, okay, you are invited to become part of the wedding party. Yeah. This is not a uh, obligation that the bride has to give to anyone, um, as well as uh, it, like, you are there as a a guest, you know, like you're supposed to help out or whatnot, but like it is, That's true. It is an yeah, honor yeah. and not anything that is um, deserved. Yeah. Um, just outright. So like, neither of these bridesmaids, um have any like claim to like i have to be in this position they might want it but there's no like you've taken something that uh i deserve away from me yeah i guess that's, that's the first thing um and, but yeah secondly th- yeah specifically the that they're they got all their money back they've been asked to leave they weren't on um, especially after being accommodating and they're they're trying to turn guests and and ruin this wedding I, w- I would call that trying to ruin the wedding at this point in time. There's there's one thing of like yeah. I'm upset, but I'm gonna leave it be. Um, but you're you're actively going out there and trying to make things worse. They're essentially retaliating, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so they're they're continuing the conflict rather than allowing it to end. And I think this person has been very accommodating too. I mean, she's proposing several different solutions to the issue without just saying, Hey, your dog can't be there. Your dog could be outside, you know? Um, and her friend just won't, uh, won't consider these, these compromises, you know? It's just, it feels, I don't know, like, like she feels like she's, I guess, entitled to this position or she deserves this thing. The friend um, does. And that, saying. The friend, yes, yes, okay, specifically. Yeah. The the bridesmaid, I guess the other one that's cited in solidarity. Um yeah, I, I I can't see anything that the the bride did that was uh you know, how she put it, um a cruel decision. There was nothing cruel here. It's interesting with several of these cases that we've looked at so far, um these are people who are not an a hole and are worried about whether they are right mm-hmm. so they they're they're concerned whether they did something wrong mm-hmm. you know um so I guess you know let's let's go to uh, let's let's find an actual thing so I'm gonna bring up like virtue ethics um mm. okay what what is it to be uh, virtue ethics deals with being excellent at things like trying to be yeah, excellent and, and having game. certain um characteristics or qualities that one cultivates that exhibit that excellence, you know, and, and I would say her friend is being vicious, you know, Mm -hmm. retaliating in being sort of egotistical, insisting on having things her way. Um, but I would say the bride is, I mean, I don't know know, what her character is really like, but what she's showing in this is being accommodating. I mean, it, like you put it out, it's her day, right? So mm-hmm. she is the most important person, and yet she's willing to try to propose these compromises so her friend can be in the wedding, you know? Right. Um, I mean, what would we call that? Being considerate? Um, uh, yeah, accommodating? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, being equitable is how Aristotle would actually talk about it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, she's trying to be just to the situation of like seeing what her needs are and to, mm-hmm. you know, uh, accommodate for those needs. But um, you know, no compromise can be made. And once the the compromise cannot be made, then um, you know, the 
bridesmaids acting vicious in retaliation. Um, it shows like a, a feeling of vindictiveness as well as um, specifically like trying to destroy the thing that you were once part of. Yeah. I was thinking we should do another wedding thing, but you mentioned uh, we should look at one where somebody probably is the a-hole. So I'm going <laughs> to bring one up like that and read it. And uh, I think this one's pretty straightforward. Yeah. Am I the a-hole for telling my daughter to work out? Now, the title by itself, no. No. Right. But the situation. So I, 47 year old male, have a 16 year old daughter. Me and her mother don't mention her weight much, but she refuses to work out. She sits in her room 24 seven on her phone, stays up until four, takes naps and eats throughout the day, sometimes eating snacks in the middle of the night. Me and my wife told her to go for a 30 minute walk every day, but she doesn't listen to us. She says she will, but she never does. Just adding on to her unhealthy habits. She's also grown two to three inches in the past two years and gained a lot more weight. She's at a regular weight now, but it's slightly increasing every appointment. We're sitting at dinner when we're having a debate about how digestion works. Weird topic. It makes more sense with context. We moved to metabolism and I told her she's visibly gained weight and she needs to work out and cut down a bit and how she never works out and it would be best for her. She left the table and went to her room, and my wife berated me for that comment because Claire had insecurities in the past. She was also crying, and my wife told me I was an a-hole for that comment. But I said she needed to work out for her health in general, and nothing we told her was getting the job done. Am I the a-hole? I agree with the wife. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, me too. I mean, it's one thing to have concerns about health right Mm -hmm. it's another to express them in a way that you know is going to be hurtful and insist on doing it that way and i think one of the things that's so telling though she's at regular weight right now right? right so this is somebody who is criticizing his daughter not for where she actually is but where he's worried that she's going to be i mean there's lots and lots of men, also women like this, who um, give their kids eating disorders by projecting this this kind of thing onto them, you know? Yeah. Well, I'm exactly there. Like She's at a normal weight now. Um, yeah. And he literally calls her fat. Like, you gained a lot of weight. Um, I don't know. If you're, I don't know. I, I don't think I've met a single 16-year-old girl that is going to react positively to your parent telling you that right yeah um and and some of this seems a little bit hyperbolic she sits in a room 24 7 on her phone stays up till four takes naps eats throughout the day i mean we need a little bit more context here she's not going to school is this in the summer you know what what's going on here and i mean frankly um Teenagers do that kind of stuff. I mean, right. It's like, that's normal. Yeah. I mean, we stayed up as late as we possibly could. We like, actually, I remember me and my buddy, we tried to see how long we could possibly go without sleep, you know, before we would fall asleep, you know? Um, <laughs> how many days did you get to? And, you know, eating uh, throughout the day, uh, eating snacks in the middle of the night. Again, uh, I'm not going to say all teenagers do that or that it's healthy behavior, but teenagers eat a lot more than than adults do you know and she's obviously actively growing she's grown two to three inches yeah. in the past two years you know she's eating enough to you know at least provide for her body the ne- necessary nutrients to grow that much so yeah like if she had again, grown two to three inches and she didn't gain weight then you'd be worried right right on um, then this uh you know the the only time is like is is she like morbidly obese to the point where like she's ca- is causing her medical issues like right, right. yeah then 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 you you need to have some sort of intervention but on uh, going and saying like you're fat is not going to uh, help that <laughs> it's like yeah I mean it's interesting too because he says that both um, he and his wife 
have been trying to, you know, like tell her to take walks and stuff like that and are worried about, but his wife can at least recognize that he's being an, an a-hole. Right. And if you're going to do that, don't just tell them to do that. Go and walk. Doesn't he say yeah. like he goes for yeah. walks? It's like, invite her to go walk with you. That was something that some of the people in the comments said, you know, why there were two things I thought that were very interesting. One is if you want her to take walks, you need to bring her along on walks. And the other was, why are you worried about her going to work out? Why don't you find some sort of exercise that she actually likes doing? Not everybody likes going to the gym. Maybe she'd like bicycling or, you know, um, I don't know, throwing a ball around or something like that. Yeah. I'm trying to think of like what's a, a good um you know ethical standard that we could apply here. Care. Um so and this is interesting because so in a certain way he is being caring by mm. having concern and I mean it seems a bit misplaced given some of the mm. things he says, but you can be caring sometimes in let's call it the directedness or the orientation of what it is that you're focusing on and then be totally uncaring in the way that you approach somebody about it. You know, I mean, imagine if you had like an alcoholic friend, right. And you're like, can't take you anywhere. Alky, you know, we don't want you getting drunk all the time. I mean, that's, that's a terrible thing to say to somebody, you know? Right. What were you going to say? Reminds me of two things. The first thing is, you know, there's a a line that gets bandied about in some quote from something. It's like, "You're not wrong. You're just the asshole." <laughs> <laughs> and and so, like, technically, he's not wrong. Right. Right. Um, and then the second thing is, like, from um, Epictetus, the, the Stoic philosopher, um, in his discourses, talks about um, the two handles that everyone mm. has: two handles, and one handle will uh break it will not hold up the pot um whereas the other one will uh you can lift it and that there's um you need to know how to approach each individual person in a way that they will actually uh be receptive to the thing that you're saying to them yeah that that is a that's a good uh adage to bring up everything has two handles one of them the thing can be carried. The other one, it can't be. And, you know, especially when you're dealing with younger people, um, I think some people think they they call it tough love. They think, like, being yeah. an, an a-hole is somehow going to, like, snap them out of it. I mean, I've, I've, Just, I, I have to admit, I've tried that sometimes with my own kids. It's never worked. <laughs> Never, never for the long term. I would get compliance occasionally, mm-hmm. but um, it always did more damage to the relationship than anything else. You know? Yeah. Are they, are they compliant because they agree with you, or because they don't want you to be angry, or they don't like you being angry? Around there you them? go. Yeah, that's right. No. Yeah. Um, can well, we uh, skip to the the rent one here? Sure. Yeah, we can do yeah. that, and then maybe come back to the uh, the other wedding one, which I think is very interesting if we have the time. Sure. Okay, so um, am I the a-hole for not wanting to pay rent to my boyfriend? I'm 25 and moving in with my significant other, 30. He's owned his house for many years and makes mortgage payments. He can more than afford it and makes five to six times more salary than I do. I'm happy to contribute my half of groceries, utilities, etc., but is asking for extra rent, even though I am not part of the mortgage. He didn't previously rent it out or have any roommates. It's a big house. I would also like to add that he is the only one who really wanted me to move in with him. I was on the fence and would have been fine waiting another year. What do you think is fair? Question. Um, I think she should get the hell out of there. <laughs> right. I think this. Right. Is, I think there's red flags in this. Um, what, what do you What do you say? Like right now, I would say. On uh, none, no one's the asshole yet because she okay. hasn't moved. See, this is a proposal, and so like, there's like, okay, there's definitely some weirdnesses here, and unless he's like, this is the only way this is happening, and you have to move in, then it'd be like, yeah, you're 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 proposing a really assholey um, contract here. Yeah. Um, if this is just like an initial proposal and he hasn't really thought it through, then maybe not. Um, but I'm not quite sure about that. Let's see if I can get the camera to actually get me on. Um, and uh, 
yeah, uh, I guess the other person is that, like, if he's um, owns this place, he's not putting you on the rent and wants you to pay into it, or yeah, because um, it's putting you even if you're not paying for it, it's still also bad because now you're in this position of power where you're. Um, in a relationship, and it's not like you're not married, so you haven't like joined finances or anything. Um, and now he's the sole person that's providing you um, housing. Yeah, yeah. And if it ever goes south, then obviously it's going to result in um, you not having the housing anymore. I mean, the right term for somebody uh, whose mortgage you are helping to pay uh, without getting any equity, is your landlord. Right. So I think he's he's proposing that he become her landlord, but also remain her boyfriend, lover, whatever, you know, partner, whatever mm-hmm. it's going to be. And I, I don't think those are good um, categories to mix up. You not, know? not usually, no. I mean, it's interesting because my mother had an arrangement. She had a live-in boyfriend who had his own business, uh, and he lived with her for 10 years and she owned her own house out in Menominee Falls. Um, there was a mortgage, but she had it. She was like, it was almost paid off by the time that she sold it and then moved to Brookfield shortly before she ended up dying. And he had to pay utilities, uh, some of the groceries and, uh, property tax. Mm. Um, and then she paid all the rest of the stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Including like, you know, upkeep, you know, the, the kinds of, you know, the plumber needs to be called in. She paid for all that sort of stuff. And I was like, boy, he's really skating by. I mean, he gets the whole house basically to do what he wants to do in. And, um, he doesn't have to pay rent. He's, Mm -hmm. he's basically, um, paying, you know, much smaller amount of, of money than he would be if he was renting a place like this. Um, and she was cool with that, you know, and I, I'd sometimes yeah. ask her about that. Why don't you charge him rent? And she'd be like, well, that wouldn't make sense. You know, uh, I'm not giving him any equity in the house. You know? <laughs> <laughs> this guy, uh, it's sort of like what we talked about before, like with the guys, parents, the Australian guys, this yeah. guy wants to have things more than one way. Right. Right. I like I, I like your idea though about he's not yet the a hole, yeah. But should he put this into effect, he becomes one. So right. so proposing it doesn't make him one. Following through on it does. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you want to hit this wedding one really quick? Yeah. So this is this is one I really quite like. Am I the a hole for being honest with my friends on why I'm not having a wedding? I, 31 female, will be getting married legally but have no interest in a wedding. I also don't have an engagement ring. My friends have always been fascinated by why I've made these decisions as they have not been strictly financial ones. And numerous times I've brushed it off as just not for me. After yet again, another round of questions and assumptions about why I'm not doing these things, I was honest. I personally find it all pretty basic that we all have identical weddings and wear identical rings. At least in my brain, it just isn't even close to being worth the money for things that are so often so unoriginal. And I'm not interesting enough to do something different. I couldn't care less what other people do with all their money. And I enjoy my friends' wedding days and I am nothing but positive about them. I understand people will all do similar things in the sake of tradition, which is why I do a lot of things. Just this one isn't worth the money for me personally based on what I find value in and enjoy. My friends are now really offended and are saying that I called them basic. I think I'm allowed to have my own opinions on stuff, and they're not allowed to take it so personally when they've asked so many times. I don't get offended when my friends do things differently to me for their own reasons. I need to know whether I should have kept my mouth shut and or if I should apologize. And the key term here is the term basic, which you know some of our listeners may not know has become a uh, in recent years a uh, pejorative derogatory. Term. Yeah, yeah, it's you know it means like. Uh, simple or uninteresting or something like that. Mm. I'm very, I'm very sympathetic to her. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say the biggest a-hole here is the wedding industry. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, <laughs> the average wedding, if if I remember right, these days is something like $50,000. 
And I am totally receptive to this idea that that's a, a waste of money on things that are essentially are coming from an industry that just churns this stuff out with what in uh, economics they used to call marginal differentiation. Like, how should your dress look? It's going to be white. Do you want to have frills here or frills here? You know, do you yeah. want it to like have uh, a long train or a short train? Let's get you a cake now. How many layers is it going to have? Will there be a little bride and groom on top? Blah, 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 blah. Right. All, all this nonsense. Do you, do you want a diamond ring with one or two or three <laughs> stones in it? There you go. Yeah. Uh, but it has to be a diamond ring. And that diamond ring better spe- because be the cost of your the husband's or the uh, yeah. bridegroom's. It's like three uh, or two three months. Three months. Okay, three months. Yeah. Of, of income. That's just an insane amount of money for a, a, a rock that is actually quite abundant. Yeah. Uh, but De Beers owns everything. Yeah, and... I think she's being, um, you know, kind of careful and not hurting her friend's feelings. And she only does so when they won't shut up about it. Right? <laughs> right? I feel like there's definitely a um, – they're being presented with something that they think is valuable. Yeah. And they expect all their friends to also agree that it is valuable. And once they are confronted with someone that says they do not agree with this, then you have to either agree with her yeah. that it uh, doesn't have this intrinsic value that you think it does, or you have to have some cognitive dissonance and you'll become angry as a defensive mechanism to maintain this idea and as well as to justify the reason why you spent $50,000 on a wedding. Yeah. I think her friends brought this on themselves. And I, I, I'm thinking about analogies. And I was going to originally say, like, you know, does this dress make me look fat? Right. And, you know, he said, no, no, you look great in it. Right. Are you sure about that? Are you sure about that? Couldn't maybe just a little bit. And then finally, somebody's like, yeah, fine. The dress makes you look fat. See, you don't like my dress. Right. But I think a better analogy would be somebody makes a kind of, uh, meal, a dish, right? And it's not very good. And it might be good for other people, but you find it kind of bland and you're like, yeah, it's not really my kind of thing. And so you're, you're eating it. You're there at the table, you know, you're eating it up, you're, you're having your serving and they're like, so what do you think? And you're like, mm, yeah, it's, it's interesting, you know? And then, you know, you, they keep pressing you. And by the time that you've actually like eaten the whole bowl of their crappy chili or whatever it is, you know, you find you're finally like, yeah, I think it was a little bland. I I'm not a fan. I would change the recipe. Oh, I can't believe you said that, you know. Um well look what's your own damn fault for for <laughs> pushing on it over and over yeah. and over again. I think her friends are totally in the wrong here. You know? There's a yeah, uh, was it mess around, find out? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's the, yeah, they did it. <laughs> yeah. They, they they goaded her to tell her what she actually thought. And they didn't like what she actually thought. It's like, well, if you didn't want to know the answer, don't ask the questions. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll say very quickly, because we have to wrap up soon. There's another slogan that I learned as a, a young, stupid man. Uh, <laughs> and it was one of the best things somebody ever told me. Act like an a-hole, get treated like an a-hole. You know? So yeah. useful. So yeah. do you want to lead us out on a... Uh, uh, final thought we've got the words of Bill Cropper how do you keep people from jerking your chain don't give your chain to jerks <laughs> <laughs>